Welcome to a delayed edition of the Psychovertical podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Andy Kirkpatrick. Um, I apologize for the delay. Uh, I've been uh, traveling and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was tra- I've been trying to keep to my schedule because my daughter, if I miss if I miss uploading this podcast, my daughter gets on my case and tells me I have to. So um, maybe this may- maybe this might replace one. <laughs> this might replace one on Tuesday. Because what day? What day? Is it Sunday today? Yeah, but it's Sunday anyway. This is some day of the week. So, um, um, yeah. So, but I know what it's like when you when you go to download a podcast and it's not there, and it's always highly highly distressing, and you have to. But sometimes it's good because you have to go and find some other uh, podcast, um, which might be a lot a lot better, like Grimer's podcast or something. Um, thanks for all the feedback I've been getting. Uh, uh, hopefully, the sound is slowly getting better. Uh, I'm still unable to really do any um, uh, Skypey like interviewing, having conversations with people because the because wherever the wherever the Wi-Fi is good enough to do it, the sound is terrible. There's too much noise, and where there's where there's not a lot of sound, uh, there's the crap Wi-Fi. So I'm currently recording this uh, where I live, and it's kind of kind of quiet. Uh, I have this weird I have this weird thing every day where. Um, like you have the call to prayer about, and I'll keep going about the call to prayer. We have the call to prayer, like so. It's, it's kind of it's not. I, 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 what I say, it's annoying, but uh, when you get the call to prayer at like half past four in the morning, uh, five o'clock in the morning, um, it's a little bit irritating. Um, but when the uh, when the call to prayer starts, like the well, and it starts and it goes on for a little bit and then it stops. So if you're if you're devout, uh, you have to get up, you have to pray, then you have to go, then you probably go back to bed or something. Uh, or go or get in your car and drive around the streets making lots of noise and doing like you know sort of skids and stuff like some people seem to do but anyway but every day when you have this when you have the call to prayer uh someone starts making themselves be sick uh in where we live uh whether it's whether in this block of flats or another block of flats it's kind of really it's kind of really weird it's like a little thing you know like the call to prayer suddenly sort of dies away and the person has obviously stopped praying and then they start like making themselves be sick. So it's a little like little uh, little sort of window into the <laughs> strange nature of uh, of humanity. So um, so yeah. So what was my point? Oh yeah. So um, thanks for the feedback. Uh, and uh, I've decided on reflection uh, not to stop waffling and rambling because it sounds like that's probably the only thing that's. Uh, that's interesting. Um, interesting about this podcast is that not the stuff I'm supposed to be talking about, but all the other stuff. Speaking of which, um, because I didn't get this, because I didn't get the podcast out on time, uh, I had loads of good reasons. Mainly, I just couldn't be asked to do it. Um, I think I was, I was, having, I was having a bit of a, I was having a bit of a day where I just couldn't be asked really. Uh, couldn't be asked with the world, and I, I apologize. I want, one, one thing you, one thing you, it's really important to learn. When you're a when you're on the stage, darling. When you're a when you're a stage actor like I am, is um, so. In, if if you're a if you're a performer, a monologist as I am, as one of my livings, uh, and you stand on a stage, um, you kind of need an audience. Otherwise, you're just a crazy person, or you're really rich and you can just afford to like hire a venue and just stand there and talk to yourself. So. You have this thing where when you first start, like luckily now having having done tours for a long time, generally I would say either they sell out and they're not like they're not like giant venues, but generally they either sell out or they're about like eighty percent full, which is which is good. And that's one that's why it's often better to do a really small venue, like even like a pub where you can get a hundred people in it, rather than a venue where you can get like eight hundred people in it. Because even if you have you know, like eight, if you'll 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 manage to find like a hundred people to fill a pub in um, like Aberdeen or somewhere. But if you can only manage to get like five hundred people in like a eight hundred seat venue, then it feels you feel a bit crap. Where you don't feel as you feel like oh god, why why is no one coming to see me talk? So yeah, little venue like a really good venue. Yeah, like that's so yeah. That's why comedy clubs. Uh, and those people often say to me, like, oh, why don't you go on the comedy? I am actually funny sometimes. But people are like, why don't you go on the comedy circuit? And uh, and I said, have you ever been to, like, a comedy club? There's, like, 30 people in there. You know, like, what's the point, really? So, but the the lesson, the, the lesson of this story is, 
is there is a tendency sometimes if you do a if you go somewhere and you're talking and not many people turn up like like I've had like on the I think the first podcast I did it was about my life my life as a performing artist or something is um is you you know you'll, you'll turn up and there's like like a really disappointing number of people. Like I know, like I remember David Brashears, Brashears, what his name is, who climbed Everest and stuff and made films. He he came to Sheffield once and only three people came to see him, which is like crazy. It was like God turning up and no one, and I've, had, I've read the book, you know, like people didn't come and see him. So uh, I've never been, it's never been that bad, but sometimes uh, you you realise, like more, more in the past, less now, but you were like totally crushed and there because there wasn't many people came to see you. And you have this, the reason you're on stage is that you want to be loved and adored and, you want someone to fill in all the gaps that you know where you should be able to give yourself a hug and all that kind of stuff. You know, you want to, and it's it's almost like the worst worst ever thing anyone could ever do. Basically, I don't. Know, I highly recommend if you've not seen it, one of the best films, comedy films ever made, which is a film that not hardly anyone's ever seen, is Hamlet Two with Steve Coogan. But there's a there's a really good line in there about like you know like I was I felt rejected by my father so I became an actor and then I could be then I, then I could be rejected by the audience, um, but but a sign of a true professional, maybe you can apply this to other things in your life, is that when when hardly anyone turns up, don't punish the people who did. You know what I mean? Like, don't be like, oh, God, I'm going to give you like a heart, you bastards. I'm going to give you, a, just going to r- run through it and get off the stage as soon as possible. No, like when, when hardly anyone turns up, that's when you have to give it like the absolute maximum performance and give people like people, make them feel like when they, when they, when they could go away, they're like, oh, my God, like anyone didn't come and see that. They were, they're a fucking idiot. Like that was amazing. Rather than like, oh, Christ, I can see why no one came. Um, so yeah, lesson over. So, but, so, but on the subject of reliability, so when, I, when you don't post a podcast, like I, I, I was annoyed to not post, well, I kind of, I wasn't annoyed at all, but I'm, I'll tell you I was, cause then it makes me feel like I was annoyed. But, um, on the subject of not posting a podcast when you're all, you know, like you're all, I think the, the, the most, I think one podcast has had like 5,000 people listen to, listen to it. And that doesn't mean they got to the end. They're probably like, what the hell's this shite? Um, but th- those like five people out there who were, who were just dying or maybe one who were dying to listen to the problem. My daughter were dying to listen to this podcast. You know, what's he going to say this time? Um, and you were disappointed. Um, the importance of reliability, I reckon. And I think it, people don't really talk about reliability that much, but I think it is like a real, a real fundamentally important thing is that people need to know what you are or what something does. Like they don't matter. They don't mind if it, like, you don't mind if you're shit, like, Oh, that guy's shit. And then you are shit. It's like, well, he at least is reliable, you know? Um, but I, I often make this analogy with a hammer, you know, like if you got a hammer, you bought a hammer, and the first nail you're trying to bang in, the hammer breaks. You're like, oh, that's a bit of shit, you know. Um, so, so if you're going to be a hammer, you know, be a hammer. And uh, for a, a, a while ago, I had some. I sort of worked with Patagonia a little bit. And when you work for Patagonia, maybe I've told this story already, but when you work for Patagonia, you get this big dossier of like how to, you know, like basically to program you into be a Patagonia type person. Uh, must eat organic food and all that kind of stuff. Must go surfing and all, must learn to swim. Um, and, uh, must preach to people not to fly while flying. Um, I'll, uh, but in this big dossier of like the, the world according to Patagonia, there was uh, this big thing about uh, big thing about McDonald's. Um, the probably this is probably top secret. It's probably going to destroy the. They haven't got stocks and shares, but anyway, um, Yvonne Schuenard's going to be like, no. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so Yvonne Schuenard is a secretly a massive big McDonald's fan, and um, and partly it's well mainly it's because like, McDonald's have this amazing uh, supply chain, uh, which is like built up over like you know. 50 years or something so because the most important thing for mcdonald's is reliability and that is why if you're in like uh you know like you're in um saudi arabia or you're in you know like argentina or you're in alaska if you go and buy some chips from mcdonald's 
they will taste exactly the same. There's no like special like curry sauce on them or whatever. Like they're exactly what they're supposed to be. And that is why McDonald's is like so successful is like, I, I, I would actually argue, I don't actually think it's, um, I don't actually think McDonald's is bad for you. I think actually the, the people who eat it, you know, they're, they're, they're the bad element, not, not the actual, not the actual food. You shouldn't punish people for producing what people want, which is, you know, you know, it's the, it's the people who are garbage, not the, not the food. <laughs> anyway, I quite like McDonald's. Anyway, so um, I am a garbage person, but it's in my DNA. I can't help it. So, um, so, yeah, so I always, I always, I always uh, thought about, I always think about that. And McDonald, um, McDonald's, but, and every time you see picked up Patagonia, you'd be thinking McDonald's now, is uh, Patagonia had this thing where they, um, I think someone found a, like a supplier of buttons. Uh, is, they had these like buttons made out of like, you know, testicles of walnuts or something, or some kind of like organic kind of thing. And they um, they found like a cheaper, you know, a cheaper one, like, you know, like the teeth of a raccoon or something. They, they found these like cheaper buttons, you know, so they were saving maybe like five pence, uh, five cent, five cents, um, five dimes um, on uh, on buttons. So they were, oh, great, this is great, we're going to you know, we're going to, we're going to make a lot more money with this. So anyway, what happened was all the buttons started breaking. So, you know, you'd put, you'd be there in Hawaii, you know, like, you know, hanging, hanging 10 and uh, your button would break and you'd be like, fucking hell, this is, oh God, this is terrible. I'm going to buy a North Face one next time. So the, so the, so the cost of the buttons breaking was actually, was like, it potentially could be like, millions and millions of of you know if you think of all the money that was invested by patagonia and the goodwill and people telling people buy this and all that kind of stuff and suddenly like your buttons this little button that costs like one one pence you know, or a fraction of a pence breaks is incalculable really so so yeah so reliability is very very important so you know so hmm, very important in, in in life and everything else um <laughs> Before we go on to the crack on with the thing, one reason I was, one reason like I think I didn't do the podcast was I was kind of, like I, I made this mistake like a, um, like probably, probably a year ago. Like I went, I went through a, I went through a phase where, well, people would say I was being very political, but I don't, I don't see it as being political. I'm not actually interested in politics. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in why people think the way they do. I'm not interested in what they think. I'm just interested in why they, why they kind of think it. So I went through like a period where I wasn't really that interested. I was actually I was actually climbing all the time. I literally every day I was going climbing. I was like traveling around the world, going climbing. But the, the more climbing, it's a bit like you know if if you have if you're not having sex, like sex is the only thing you can think about. But when you can have as much sex as you want, you're not really that arsed, really. It's a bit like that, really. So I was I wasn't really that bothered about climbing because I was actually climbing all the time. So I was, but I was more interested in, in other things, like kind of weird, weird stuff about why people think the way they did. So I went through like a phase of, uh, of like posting just weird, just weird things that came into my head or weird things I, I read or you know, often there were like little tiny, like a little fragment of some of something. And, and I just I just like post an image and and whatever. And um, I would say this was like this was uh and this probably went on for a while. Anyway, loads of people thought I'd gone crazy. And I remember like uh, Niall Grimes said, uh, <laughs> he said he would interview me, interview me on my podcast, but I couldn't talk of any like Unibomber kind of stuff. I didn't even know the Unibomber was. I kind of had an idea, but um, I read I read the Unibomber's manifesto and it probably was actually exactly what I was like, you know, talk, talking about. Um, so so anyway, so I did this and I, it, it probably, it really kind of, wrecked my uh my life in a way because because of reliability like people just want me to be this climbing person of and a, and a, spe a very specific kind of climbing person and if they if they you know come to my uh if they come to the, my instagram or twitter and i'm not talking about that i'm talking about something else then people are kind of outraged and they're like stick to what you know and all that kind of stuff and people email you and you know you know so it's uh and because of again because of my dna i'm not a kind of person who can who will i don't really i don't really i don't submit very easily which i, I, I wish i did really um 
I always have this this story I tell them like a million times. It's probably not even true, but it's one of these. It's probably like a lie that that's become truth, and it's because it's a lie. It's probably not actually serving me very well. But I remember this story where someone wanted my mum to do um, something kind of illegal, and you know my mum was like super poor, and she she always she always like jokes. If I ever said we were poor when we were kids, she's like, "You were poor, you were poor. I was poor, you know." So it's you know she she wants to own it basically. So um, so yeah, but someone wanted to do this something illegal, and she said, "Oh no, I can't. It's against my principles." And this woman was like. Sue, you're too poor to have principles. And she was like, no one's too poor to have principles. And so that that kind of, <laughs> that kind of, you know, it kind of, uh, it kind of is like probably like a foundational thing in in me is that uh, like I don't like, you know, people say I don't like bullies. People, people often say that are actually bullies themselves. But I don't, I, I don't like, uh, I think I've wrote, I think I wrote a story. I've got a story somewhere. It's a really, really grim story. It might be in my book. It might, it might be in uh, Unknown Pleasures. But it was when I was a kid and all these kids got me and like held me down and they all just started spitting on me and uh, and I just um, literally just like spitting all over me and I just couldn't, I was on, I was like much little smaller than they were and I couldn't get away. And uh, But it was this feeling of like sort of taking it, just, ta- just take it. Does that make any, does that make any sense? Um, so yeah, so the, the more, the more I feel... Uh, the more I feel I have to just give in, it, it makes me kind of double down, really, which is probably. But I think, and also there was a, there was probably an element of of at the time of me not wanting to be a very liked person. It's kind of like self like self destruction is a very uh, it's a very <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's like a process. It's very uh, it can be very healthy, I think, in a way, to destroy yourself because then you have to sort of make something. You have to make something else. So if you're not really, if you don't really feel like you're anywhere, it's a, it's a, I probably have to write a book. I have to write it all down because it's actually quite complicated. But I, end, I ended eventually stopping because uh, because Vanessa, my wife, she just found it too upsetting because uh, because how people would see me was wasn't how how I would how I was. You know, people would. People thought I was a racist or, you know, misogynist and all that kind of stuff that was very, you know, 2010s. Um, and that's kind of not who, not really who I am. And she was always like, why don't you just, like when you when you talk about things, people can understand what you're saying. But when you write it, it you just sound like a crazy person. And probably the, the, you know, because on Instagram and Twitter, you haven't, you don't actually have much, much of a room to actually make a very, you know, strong case. And then you get to the point where you just don't really care what anybody, like if someone's not going to meet you, it's not halfway, it's probably like, you know, 99% of the way there. Um, then you're not, you're just not, it's not even worth, it's not even worth the effort really because so many people are, you know, they, they just can't, they, they'll never understand what you're trying to say. You know, they'll just immediately think you're saying something bad because they don't understand what you're saying. So, um, but anyway, so, so I stopped doing all, I stopped, I decided not to do that really. Maybe sometimes, every now and again, I might go crazy and say, you know, say something on Twitter or something. But I kind of stayed stayed away from it, just just for your own kind of mental health, really. And, but then last week, uh, I saw that someone, or well, someone saw, posted a really, posted a picture of me that wasn't me, it was like some naked guy. Um, and it was something about Alex Honnold, like staying out of politics. And maybe it was like a reference to, reference to me staying out of politics and as i say i'm not i'm not a political person and uh so so i made like a small defense of alex honnold on my uh on my uh instagram stuff and i was I basically was like that you shouldn't shouldn't punish somebody like you shouldn't punish someone you know the classic thing is alex honnold says something which could be mildly viewed as having a political position about you know malcolm malcolm um martin, martin luther king or something and about you know reparations or you know like so, yeah, this 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 kind of stuff that's like highly charged like you could have said it you know 15 years ago no one would have cared everyone would have been like i totally agree with you alex but now it's like so these things are so charged that you know it was it seemed to me he seemed to be getting a lot of flack from people you know he wasn't he wasn't saying anything he's not going to do any say anything like really crazy but um and i, I think i just said like just why can't we just like you know, so Joe Rogan is you know one 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 side of the world now thinks Joe Rogan's this like sexist, homophobic, 
asshole, you know, and Bernie Sanders is like associating himself with him. And the other half knows the truth is none of those things. But, you know, one side are like, I'm never going to listen to Joe Rogan ever again. And it's like, have you ever listened to Joe Rogan? Because if you hit, if you did, then you wouldn't be saying that because you, have, you would have known, you know. So, so you know, with Alex, he's like, I'm never going to buy a North Face jacket ever again. It's like, what, you're not going to buy stuff from like a some hellish sweatshop in like in uh, Vietnam. Anyway, so, um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so I just kind of tried to defend Alex a little bit. Like I said, I don't necessarily... And I, I always, I made that mistake. You should never say that. You should never, because people always say, say about me, like, oh, I don't, I don't always agree with what Andy says, but, and, it, and it's a way of like distancing yourself from somebody. And so you don't get any like blowback. I remember that time when you said that guy from the, you know, the, the Nazi party was actually, you know, he was quite good at making, you know, like fondues, you know, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I, you know, I liked his fondues, but anyway, so, so anyway, so, so anyway, so I posted this thing and then I just got this like barrage of crazy like Manson family women just kind of like, how dare you, you know, how dare you? And it's like, like hang on a minute, like I thought I was actually defending the position you take. And, and there was, and then, so then I got into the whole like white privilege, how dare a white person, you know, may even use the word Malcolm X and all this kind of stuff. So so I think I think my I think my hit. So anyway, so I ended up getting a strike, uh, a hate crime, a hit, you know, like hate speech strike on my Instagram, which was because I I think I said um, that just like in South Africa in the in the apartheid times they had this like um, comb test where they would put a comb in your hair and if it stayed there you were black and if it fell out then you were white. And so I said, oh, we, I think I said something like, I'm going to have to have like a comb test. Like if my, if I put a comb in my hair, it falls out. Therefore, I'm guilty of um, privilege. And if it doesn't, then you you can just be a racist, a bigot and get away with it. You know, so, so, um, so that was, so really what I should have done is just not said anything and just been and not even commented. In fact, I should have just deleted the, the, the Instagram post. And that was my point. So there, all these assholes who were getting on me actually proved the exact point I was making, which is the problem with all this kind of stuff, is the people are just mor morons, basically. I should actually say a nicer word, but in the... So what I was saying about Alex's thing is is it's a kind of form of violence, like political violence, is when you see someone who is just expressing a political opinion that's not extreme in any way, and everyone basically just attacks them to the point where they're like... Okay, I will never say anything ever again. I will be, you know, I will be a good, I will be, I will stay in my lane. I will be a, you know, I will just be this climbing Alex Honnold, but I can't be anything else. Is uh, for me, that's kind of unacceptable. Um, like, I'd rather have, like, when before I went crazy, I had people, you know, I was like neck and, you know, I have this thing with your neck and neck on Instagram or, you know, with followers on Twitter. Like, I've been on Twitter for like a long time. And you know you're neck and neck with this person, and then when I look now, you know they're they're uh, you know they've got forty eight thousand followers, and I've got like you know fifteen thousand followers or something. Like mine just never ever went anywhere because because of the the uh, you're, you're punished really for 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 not just being who you're supposed to be to be this you know to be, it's, it's it's in a in a way it's a kind of like a it's like a caste system or a class system where you you. Like I'm not qualified to have any opinions apart from crampons, where where really the pe often the people who are saying that are really unqualified to say anything at all because they're just by saying that they disqualify themselves from having any opinions at all if if you if you know what I mean. So um so yeah so I think after that I was just like I was just a bit like I was just a bit over it like oh Christ Almighty but. But that's not that's not the way to that. You have to you, you can't be like that. You have to, you know, in a way you have to stand up. So 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 what what, I've, what I'm going to what I'm going to eventually do, uh, like I've been talking about, like sometimes when I've been doing these podcasts, I've been talking about things that are straying out of the way, the way of uh, of, of what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is climbing related stuff. So uh, so I've decided instead of like melding any of those kind of things into this i'm just going to have a completely separate podcast which is which is not about politics but it's more about so different ways of looking at the world in a way of because probably the the, the actually the 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 bit i've actually missed out out here 
is as soon as I stopped kind of saying this kind of stuff, uh, you know, like, is that people then started coming, saying like, oh, actually, well, a lot of people were like, oh, I kind of missed that kind of stuff. Cause it was like, it was like more interesting than the climbing kind of stuff. And then other people started saying, actually, I used to think you were a complete knobhead and I did, I, I, just thought you were a crazy person or a racist or, or whatever. And, um, but now I'm actually don't think, I don't think that at all. And actually now I'm really confused and I don't really know. I don't really know what to think. I don't really know. You know I've, I've got no real compass in the, you know, to understand what's going on in the world and stuff. So, so, so it's a typical, since you stop doing it, you know, now you have like Ricky Gervais on the, you know, on the golden globes or whatever. And, you know, even my son was like, Oh, I think he was like, oh, dad, just keep doing, just, you know, I don't think you should stop, you know, being yourself, which is, which is probably down to Ricky Gervais because if someone's high profile does it, you can, you know, but then I don't want to, I don't actually like, I don't actually like being, I don't want to, you know, I don't like being trendy. I don't like being like if everyone, because that's the thing about society is they'll just flip like one minute. Everyone's the walkest person, you know, they, they, they're embracing their transgender neighbors and all that kind of stuff. And next minute, they're like going through the town with pitchforks and flaming torches and setting fire to, you know, anyone doesn't like them. So, so people are, people are very, you know, they, they flip very easily. So you never want to be with the majority ever, ever. And you always want to be you know, by yourself, sad, you know, locked up in a mental institute. So, um, <laughs> so back to the, back to the, 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 the programming. So anyways, oh yeah, that pod, so the, pod, the, the other podcast, um, is called, uh, uh, Dogma of Certainty. And it's, it's, I'll, 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 I'll stick a link somewhere when it, when it, when I do the first one, but I'm gonna have to actually r properly write it out because it's, um, it's actually, it's, it's not it's not stuff you can ramble on easily about without kind of saying something that's going to be misconstrued or whatever but um so yeah so if in, and even if no one listens to it it makes me feel like you know when when the you know in the you know in a, in 50 years time when people are you know pretending they weren't involved in this kind of stuff that's that could turn out really really nasty at least i'll be able to say it but i had a podcast you know you know so, anyway so um so yeah so the subject of this podcast is actually to do with i'm going to say uh, it's, well technically it's to do with relationships which sounds a bit like it's going to be like an, an episode of Grey's anatomy or something but it's it's not really um it, like i think i think was it like, like the last last podcast what, what i want to do is actually uh, I had a, uh, this was a question that was on my on my blog, and I was just going to read the question, and I was just going to like read through my answer because because it's to do with something that happened uh, uh, recently. Not 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 nothing. No relationships with involving me, but uh, that someone said to me when I was at, when I was doing a slideshow somewhere. So, and I think it's kind of in. I think I've been reread it recently. I think it's. Um, I must have written it in a, in a spark of. Uh, of kind of you ever seen true detective you know the first series of true detective it's a bit like rusty out of true detectives kind of thing he would write it's a bit it's kind of uh anyway it's it's, it's what it is so um so i'll read you i'll read you the the question so it was like hi andy i'm sure you were extremely busy you're applying to russian questions about russian aiders and which fifi is best uh you don't even need to respond i always respond people say that um, like, ha, showed you. Um, but are climbers more susceptible to relationship issues more so than normal people? Um, so this is a, it's actually really, it's actually a really good question. Uh, because, you know, climbers, you know, climbers are, they're, they're, they're a really disaster really. But then I think climbers, surfers, mountain bikers, skiers, human beings, you know, Homo sapiens, um, they're all a disaster when it comes to re relationships. So, um, so I'm going to read you. I'll read you my response, and I'll then I'll tell you why I, why I was reading this. So, so um, so it's hi. I um, I hate reading. So I'm actually reading this. Cause I want to learn how to read things when I'm reading. So, um, I think I'm the last man on the planet to be giving relationship advice. I'm better at stoves and bed beaks, but here goes. Um. My dad, a wise man, when asked a question like yours, would probably say, 
that sounds hard. Good luck with that. This kind of answer is annoying at first as it sucks the oxygen out of the question. He's not offering you any solution. It sounds like he's saying he doesn't want to talk about your problems. But often when times are tough, especially when it comes to relationships, all we want to do is talk and talk and talk. We don't want solutions. The pain of talking is all we want. It gives an emotional return that's valuable. It somehow allows us to connect with someone we love, someone we loved, someone we hate but love, someone we hate and hate but deep down we love, maybe even someone we love but actually hate, but we don't know what love is anymore. That emotional response in talking and always thinking is like poking a rotten tooth with your tongue. It does no good, it only reminds you of the constant pain you already feel. But maybe by increasing the pain, you hope for some respite. Half the pain, better than double the pain. Yes, it's, no, it's not good talking about these things if all you want to be is with your intimate pain. It only makes things worse. But when that's all you've got, that's good enough. Like a rotten tooth that either kills you through septicemia or is just pushed out by your immune system, things do eventually sort themselves out but not if you have a mouthful of rotting teeth that will either kill you or leave you sad and old and toothless. And so I'll give you a response like my dad's, but some, I will not give you a response like, so, I will not give you a response like my dad's, but somewhere in between. So let's start at the top. Our climbers people you'd want to have a relationship with. Personally, having been married to a non-climber, and a climber, as well as being in relationships with very driven human beings, I'd say that you need to be with someone who makes you feel normal, who normalizes who you are, which if you're a climber or a road cyclist, a runner, a Dungeon Dragons player, is someone who sees your abnormal behavior as normal, or if not, or if not less normal, then within boundaries of acceptance. For example, if you're addicted to meth, but your partner was a priest, how would that relationship go? He'd want to be doing good things, moral things, stuff that would look that would look after his soul, praying, helping his flock, while you'd only want to be hustling for cash and smoking meth. But if he started smoking too, very soon life would be normal. Your abhor abhorrent behaviour, just what you do, and for a while life will be perfect, a match made in hell. But then one day you can't hustle anymore. The money in the meth starts to run out and you're competing for hits. And all of a sudden it's not about love or companionship, but all about you, what you want. I like this analogy when talking about two very motivated athletes having, I like using this analogy when talking about two motivated athletes having a baby or two people with a child who need to train all the time. Um, is being with a junkie a pathway to everlasting love if neither person will ever put the other before their fix? So on that front, dating a climber allows the abnormal appear normal, but still being abnormal, you have a few issues to deal with. Number one, if one person is performing better than the other, this will introduce stress into the relationship, stress and envy. Number two, if one person wants to climb with other people because they have more fun, climb harder, have less stress and arguments, then this introduces feelings of abandonment and neglect. It's like swinging or having an open marriage. Number three, if one side has a better work-life balance, say they're a teacher and finish at 3.30 and have 10 weeks summer vacation, while well, Leone has, only has two weeks, this, this will also introduce jealousy. Number four, if one person's life is not on track or their climbing is not going well, they may well find fault in the other and that their life is shit because they can't climb enough. They're under the illusion that climbing hard makes them happy when happy, when really it's happy people who climb harder. And it's the other, and it's the other that's made, and it's the other person who's made their climbing worse. Number five, what if climbing is the thing you share, the bond, but one day one of you feels the desire to, cli to climb fade. What bond do you have left? Another factor here is that strong, long-lasting relationships are made between two adults, not between children. 
and that climbers are often not really adults. They suffer from the widespread problem of, problem of, inf of infantilism. They avoid all responsibility, make the other be the adult, sometimes financially use love as leverage to allow them to keep playing out. Such people, although cool to be around, fun, energizing, like kids, but tend to be fl flakes, fuck-ups, unreliable beyond the climbing life. Yes, it's cool being a dirtbag at 19, but less so at 49. We tend to be attracted to such people, Peter Pans and Tiger Lilies, as we need to escape the nasty adult world, crushed by responsibility. Such relationships are great in the short term, but not in the long, unless you're junkies, until the drugs run out, as we all know, as we all have to grow up sooner or later, Fred Becky being the exception. It's also worth not using the label climber here, as you could insert any obsessive. Uh, there is a spectrum. There is always a spectrum. From gaming to triathlon, road biking to CrossFit, and that old chestnut called working for a living, which can easily have nothing to do with making money, money only a positive byproduct. So yes, they're not a climber, but they spend 100 hours a week tending to their bonsai collection. Very often, the thing a person does is just a manifestation of who they are, not what they are. And that being driven is perhaps a result of a flaw that manifests itself as a positive. The driven, so the, dri the driven are po evolutionary drivers. So really, the question isn't the re question isn't do I want to have a long relationship, long term relationship with a climber, but do I want to have a relationship with someone who's driven? The answer that you need to ask yourself if you're also driven, the driven people are generally attracted to others like themselves both because they want to feel normal, but also because maybe they can be an ally and an aid to what they're driven to do. And in brackets, if I go with Alex Honnold, my grade will go up and I, can't st and I can stop using cutlery. If you're not driven or less driven, then you're going to either have a miserable life if you're with such a person, always put into the shadow, or you'll be down, or you'll be down with it. If you're the kind of person who doesn't like the sun, who enjoy, who, or who enjoys martyrdom, a positive in someone's character that manifests itself as a negative for them, but a positive for assholes. So yes, this isn't sounding too positive either way. So the alternative is to find a normal person. First off, I should say there is no such thing as normal, but there is, just as there is, there is abnormal. Again, it's a spectrum, but most people seek safe lives free from mental, physical, or emotional trauma, a cosy nest and conformity, transform, transforming from radical youths into their parents. Normal people probably make up 80% of the people on the planet, give or take a billion. This normal life, uh, unradical, a little regretful, and always a little unfilled, is what someone who wants to be happy should aim to have. But the rub is, if you have, to dr if you have drive in your DNA, Although you think you want happiness when offered, the other 20% generally reject it. Strangely, the 80% look to the 20% to live the lives they'd like to live if they could. TV, books, stories, often a window into the lives of that 20%. Are we getting anywhere here? Not really, but maybe we're moving some pieces around. On a more general theory of positive, intimate human relationships, also called love, is the core principle of being valued, which is the type of crap you, te you tell, they tell you at marriage counseling. But it's really about both people feeling lucky to have the other. There needs to be a balance of power that sloshes around but doesn't spill or is wasted. As soon as that power begins to slip, the man gets fat and lazy, hates his job, hates his life, feels his wife can't love him because how could she? Um, in brackets, he turns into a pathetic loser. The power shift stops loving him. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. <laughs> Classic. Uh, and, th and things break apart, maybe in a second, maybe over half a century. So love is a balance of power, and it's letting neither party exploit that power, love, in order, in order to get what they want, i.e. love requires constant care and supervision and balancing to be sustained 
power continually evolving from physical and sexual to emotional and intellectual, eventually to a form of power so deep and meaningful it has no name. When a driven person is trying to have a long-term relationship with a less driven person, they'll have quality and power to begin with, each side adjusting to fit the other. Give it a few weeks or months and the other side will want to sit and watch Mad Men with a takeaway while the other wants to get up at 3am to train for the Iron Man. So is there a way to avoid this? An iron rule of life for me is to tell people what you want, be that business or love, to not go around the houses and get lost, to tell lies or hide the truth, but simply say, I want X, so that the other person can say yes or no, or come to some compromise. I want a billion dollars, I can't give I can give you ten, I'll take it. But first, you need to know what you want. If you want security, kids, a house with a picket fence, then maybe that's easy to find if you find the right man. So this woman the person who asked the question was a woman. <laughs> or oh, it might not be in a woman. Um as he makes as so I'll read that again. <laughs> If you want to make, if you want security, kids, a house with a picket fence, then maybe it's easy to find if you find the right man, as he makes up 40% of the planet. If you want to travel the world climbing and forego kids and security, then it's harder, as you're limited to just 10%, and, must, uh, and most will have been taken. But then in brackets, but people are in no way fixed, either by what they want or who. But it's still possible. And they are always they are they are also looking for you. But if you want it all to have security, kids, climbing, freedom, well, this is perhaps just an Instagram fantasy. As the closer you get to this ideal life, the more you'll have to compromise, and the chances of being happy, not being miserable, as maybe a better measure, will diminish. The lives of people you imagine who have it all tend to lack even the things you take for granted. I'm 48 years old, and when I look back, it's like a jumbo jet has landed on a busy highway. The wreckage stretches out behind me, the hurt, the pain, the damage caused, things I find hard to even think about still, even though they happened decades ago. It's easy to blame such wreckage on being driven, being selfish, having bad code and faults, stuff in your DNA, a man-child who's shirked all responsibility, a brat. It's a nice image, that jumbo jet, calling myself out like that, a form of repentance, that yes, I have sinned, but now I, I, I ask for forgiveness as I'm fixed. But ultimately, you only become an adult, someone who does not smash and break the good things you're given until you take responsibility for who and what you are. Do that, understand yourself and what you want and what you're willing to give and give up and you can find long lasting love. But no more importantly, but more importantly, be someone who can be loved, climber or not. So the reason the reason I, re- I read that was when I was at this um, in this I did a slideshow recently, and some guy came up and he was he was obviously a really really good climber and he started asking me about getting divorced and so I've been a bit, a bit <laughs> I've only been the divorce once really I aspire to be divorced many times but no <laughs> I've only been divorced once but. Um, he basically wanted to know what it was like to be a climber who, you know, did a lot of climbing and traveled around and did all this kind of stuff and was divorced and had kids and everything else. And often when people talk about getting divorced, the first thing I say is like, like, have you got any kids? And if they say no, I'm like, well, it's not really, you're not really getting divorced at all. Um, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. It's got no, it's got no, yeah, yeah, yeah someone might get upset, but whatever. Uh, so, so, um, I can't remember what I actually said to him, but I think the, the I think the big thing is that often people must people mistake things in their lives. That the, the they think the problem is like the thing. Well, I think the problem's like easily fixable. Uh, you know, well, having getting divorced is not e- is not an easy thing to do, but it's kind of it's very easy to to put the blame on why you're not happy on on somebody else or some, or something else. But I, I think I told him I, I have this idea. So the the when I was a kid, um, a big film at the time was uh, the Amityville Horror, which was about a, like a poltergeist that was in this was in this uh, you know this house, and it was like 
you know, it was a gateway to hell or something. And I remember my mum had a, had a copy of the Amateurville Horror. So this was like 1970-something. Anyway, so... And uh, in in this... In this book, in this story, um, I remember reading like some little, you know, like I wasn't very good at reading. So it probably took me like all day to like read like one page. But right, I think I just read the last page of the book to see what happened. But in this, oh, my mum maybe told me. But anyway, but in this thing, like they, they ran away from this house to get away from this poltergeist. But the poltergeist like followed them to the to the next house. And the story, the 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 story goes that you can't, Escape from a poltergeist unless you uh, cross cross water, then the poltergeist can't follow you. So I've always I've always thought that was like quite a good analogy for like relation. People who think that they can fix a relationship by some like drastic drastic measure, you know. So the classic one is like I'm not happy with my life, and I think if I get divorced and leave this this mother of my children, I can just go and go climbing in the Himalayas or, or, or whatever, or, you know, I'm just going to go to America and go climbing in America. But it's, uh, it's really not, it's really not that easy and it's not that possible because basically you're haunted by some, something and you can't get away from it. Like you can't, you may, you may think you've escaped from it by getting divorced or, you know, so you can climb more, but you'll very quickly, be back in exactly the same position because it's not to it's generally not to unless you your wife or your husband's like beating you up or something um it's the generally the environment the, the problem with the environment or your life is something it's something to do with you uh rather than something to do with someone else so, so i think that was my advice with advice to him was like to try and to to try and find some alternative you know like some like sometimes things can be you can do a really radical you know it's almost like you know my, you know if someone said i don't i'm not very happy i'm just going to kill my entire family and go and go and find another one you know it's like that's kind of very fairly, fairly drastic so you might might be like maybe i've made like a really bad choice in my life but it wasn't to do with the person i married it was actually to do with my whole career and what I'm doing, what I'm doing, it just isn't, it just is just, because you have this thing where you feel like you're, you know, one, I think once you get to like your 30s, 40s, 50s, you have this feeling where you, uh, you feel like you've completely fucked everything up and you've made some really bad choices and you can feel like you're on this, you're on this track and you're never going to get off it. But really, you really, it's, it's, you, it's not a, you shouldn't codify it. You can, you can get off it as soon as you want. And, you, you know, the classic thing is people who get made redundant and they feel like it's the, the end of the world. Like one, one minute they're saying they hate this job, you know, and they want to, you know, they hate it and they want to kill themselves and they, blah, blah, blah. And then they get made redundant. It's the worst things ever happened to them and they have no job. And I would say nearly in every case, it's, a, it's like a massive, massive blessing, you know, you know, that people, they're forced to, they're forced to, uh, to change their lives. And they end up with like, they can almost like start again. This idea of like, you know, the idea again of back to the beginning of this podcast about self destruction is you you have an opportunity to to pick through the pieces of your life and work out what you want to keep and what you do, what, what you want to discard. Um. So yeah, so so the, so you remember this like so to always remember this poltergeist is with you. Like, can you actually come to some kind of arrangement with the poltergeist? Can you like? you know, sacrifice one of the kids or something, or can you, you know, do, you know, do something radical, like let's go and live in a different country or let's, I'm going to give my job up, you know, we can, you know, we're, we're, we're in a way we're kind of, um, we're, we're, we feel like we're on this, so analogy, another analogy is that you're on this train in your life and this train is like hurtling along and it's not able to stop and there's no way you can put the brakes on. You kind of know where it's going, but you have no in, you have no interest of going there, but you have no control over it. You're you're so I call it like locked in locked in life syndrome. You know, you're just there like a witness to this like shit life, and your your terrible relationship with your wife and your kids or your husband or your workmates, and your life is this terrible kind of prison. And that's and that you know to try and the only way the only way you're ever going to stop is for this train to be like 
derailed, you know, and it might just kill every all of you. It might kill you. It's like the worst thing you can imagine. And I, I, I think I joked someone the other day who was a, a psychiatrist, uh, like a healthcare professional. But the the job of like the of of doctors and people and uh, psychiatrists is that is just to keep laying the track. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's like you are really, really depressed and your life is shit and everything else. But if I give you these tablets, basically this is like giving you another extra 50 miles of track. And hopefully by the time these tablets run out, or, you know, you'll 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 have slowed down or, you know, or, or something. But, um, you know, but don't try, you know, don't do anything too radical because if you try and stop this train, the only way you can stop it is you can blow up this bridge, you know, in five miles time. But it's above a massive canyon, and uh, you will stop. But you know, you'll never go, you'll never go again. So, so yeah. So I don't I, I don't know why this like stuck in my head. But it's been in my head a long time. This guy saying this, and uh, we don't really have. I think I think we don't really have very good. We don't really have very good guidance of what to do. Really, do we? Don't really have a. You know, you don't want to. I think there's that there's that side one side of you that's. You know, there's a really, really radical idea of what to do, and then there's like a more human thing with what to do. But I think you really have to just try and find a way of dealing with it in a in a po- in a positive way, if not just kicking it down the road. And uh, yeah, try try as hard as you can. You know, like if you, it's a kind of basic life or death situation. You could be drowning. You could be dying in a storm on K two or whatever. But you really got to try as hard as you can, you know, before before you get the final option, which is either getting a divorce or dying, <laughs> dying on a mountain. So yeah, so yeah, so hopefully this, hopefully didn't that sound too negative? Hopefully, if you're if you're like sixteen, you listen to this, you'd be like, oh, that was shit. I don't get the point of that, you know. Because but if you're like, if you're forty, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, so fuck the youth, fuck the youth. Anyway, so um. So yeah, maybe because it, because this was actually a bit deeper meaningful or not, um, I'll probably do another podcast on Tuesday with about. I still haven't, I've still not done lanyards, have I? Yeah, lanyards. I'm definitely going to do. I'll, I will. I promise. I'll do lanyards on Tuesday. So anyone who is uh, you know disappointed about all this love love stuff, but anyway, but relationships. The most important thing in your life, relationships. It doesn't have to be loving somebody. Um, you know, it's. It's all, it's all, it's all the same thing, basically. Whether you're having sex with someone or not doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. So even with yourself, but you can have sex with yourself. Um, so anyway, so thanks for listening to this podcast, and uh, it's always helpful to tell people, like share it somewhere. I know people share so much; it's p- kind of pointless these days to share anything, isn't it? You know, just don't bother sharing it. Um, in fact stop listening stop listening altogether um, and uh, and that's that's all so thank you for listening and I shall see you soon <laughs>